History of Religious Education in Norway. Um, this is a Worldviews in Nordic Society um, lecture by me, Andrew Thomas, at S4 University College, which I want you to watch by the 11th of October. So we're going to look at the um, history of religious education in, in these centuries, basi basically the Reformation until today. Um, not because there wasn't any religious education before then, but, before, but because that's kind of when the documentation starts um, in a big way. And, um, and we're going to look at religious education in the sense of both in the sense of how religious was schooling, what is the um, relationship between schooling and religion, um, especially initially, but also um, towards the end of the period, um, l let's look at religious education as a thing, which is to say the subjects, religion and ethics, um, but also Christianity, religion, philosophies of life and ethics, which is what those subjects are called in, in Norwegian school. Let's go straight on. Um, we want to be looking both at what happened and how we, and how we can understand it, how we can interpret it. So, first of all, in the first season, um, in, in this period from about 1500s to the 1700s, uh, we can see that um, schooling came... Um, came into being as a religious um, uh, religious need. Uh, in 1537, we have the first school law, and that is um, as and that was instituted in a church law. It's it's in the church order of uh, 1537. Uh, and it's significantly straight after the Reformation. And then in 1736, confirmation, religious confirmation, becomes mandatory for everybody. And immediately afterwards, school becomes mandatory. Uh, there is school for everybody in 1739. Um, which is to say that what happens in these schools is preparation both for life, but also preparation to be a religious adult, good adults. Confirmation was the rite of passage which brought adults into being. Um, the state, but also the church, wanted schooled people in order that um, society would um, behave itself so there would be less crime, um, but also because um, this is... Protestant religion, and Protestant religion lays a massive emphasis on personal life, on ethics, um, and on reading. It's the Bible, it's sola scriptura, it's, um, it's uh, in order to be a good Christian, you have to be a good Christian that reads the Bible. Let's move on to the, uh, the next period, uh, which I've called the Christian school. And a lot of things um, happen in here. A lot of uh, whilst while school was purely there to um, develop confidence and, and to teach people about Christianity, in this period um, Christianity becomes one subject amongst many. In 1813, the first university, University of Oslo, comes into place where theology priest uh, theology um, is a subject there right from the beginning, um, teaching priests, but also alongside law, medicine, and philosophy. Those are the four faculties in 1813. 1860 um, is the reform where schools. Um, are no longer peripatetic, which is to say they're in, f in fixed places. There are school buildings from 1860. The law from um, from the 1500s was just for cities, um, and that was. Um, but in in the 1730s, when we had this law about connecting school to confirmation, um, schools in the countryside were also um, instituted. But they were very much the responsibility of parishes, and people would, would just wander around. Whereas in the 1860, we've got this place where people, everyone goes, and and also and also that's where where we hear not just Christianity but geography and history being an important part of schooling. In the 1889 to 96 we start seeing schools which we would recognize today in much greater extent uh, with many different subjects, um, particularly uh, geography and history like before but also science and maths. And then, and then the reform upon reform. Once you've opened this, the floodgates of lots of different um, subjects, um, religion becomes one specific bit of school rather than being a part of the school mandate. In 1969, um, a massive uh, watershed happens when uh, non-Lutheran teachers um, are allowed to teach religion, which is a sign that um, religion is not a matter of developing Christian adults, but it's a matter of it's a school subject, but also alternative. So this is it goes in both ways. Alternatives become available to um, to people, so that um, people that don't want to, uh, that aren't Christian, they can um, they can have an alternative syllabus. So there is there is still this sense that um, the school is there to develop Christian ethics, um, and our and religious studies is definitely connected to the formation of Christians. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a need for um, uh, for people to opt out of it. But you can see this kind of the beginning of a secularism um, in the nineteen in the nineteen sixties, and then a full-blown secular challenge from the nineteen nineties. But in Norway, it goes um, in two very different um, directions. 
on the one hand, we've got this um, situation where religious studies becomes obligatory for all. Um, so instead of saying of making it more divided, so that the people have more alternative options, it becomes um, it becomes a, a gathering subject that everybody has to take part in. Um, that raises obviously obvious human rights challenges um, and. Um, and in 2004, the UN Human Rights Community um, condemns the subject as yeah, it's okay that it divides uh, that it that it gathers everybody, but in that case, it has to be a sufficiently academic and objective um, subject. The European Court of Human Rights also condemned it in 2007, before that really the state has had a chance to to um, had a chance to reform the subject. Um, and so, so it's been condemned on, in two different instances because parents have been complaining that their pupils have had to, their children have had to take part in this state-imposed religious studies, which is, um, which produces this subject reform. So it's become religious life philosophies and ethics in 2007. Um, and that wasn't enough. So, in response to the European Court um, condemnation, um, the state introduces an easy exemption clause. So, the parents no longer just have to apply to have their to have their children exempted from the subject. They can just say they can just um, they can just inform the school that they don't want their children taking part in this particular thing. Now, this exemption clause is um, is a truth with particular modifications. It is still a subject that everybody has to take, um, but it is not a subject where teachers just decide how they can teach their their pupils. Parents can sign their children out from teaching forms, forms of um, of pedagogy, but they cannot sign their children out of the subject. It's still a universal subject. And then in 2014, what I call a backwards reform, which is to say the, cha the name changes back towards the 1997 subject, is now no longer called religion, philosophies of life and um, ethics, but Christianity, religion and philosophy of life and ethics, uh, which is to say that um, Christianity has to have um, over half of or around half of the, um, of the content. So this, there's this open question, is, is religious study still connected to formation? And the reason the European um, court condemned it was that, that it was not because every, um, people should have to study these things, people should study religion, um, but that this religious studies um, subject seems to be connected to forming good pupils. I think we noticed that um, this issue that in, in this period, we've got a period when um, rather than Christianity being a, um, a simply an issue of formation um, it's um, it's the school is the um, tool of formation in this period and religious studies is much more of a um, uh, an academic subject but also there's an issue of religion not being an issue of identity as much or, um, or or a way of creating good human beings but it's first and foremost a matter of human rights and I think we see human religion as a human rights issue um, more and more in this period and afterwards 2003 um, this we, we see this um, something that may have caught up this um, this human rights issue, namely that um, financing for religious formation outside school is still in place, so the state is still financing religious formation, specifically because of re the religion's human rights. Should the state form a, um, finance religious activity? Open question. In other words, we've got lots of historical developments, but they're around the um, rational um, questions. Who is to teach whom? Who can sign out and who is qualified to teach about religion? And what is being taught? Which religions should be included? And how is it to be taught? Should, be, should it be taught ethically or should it be taught historically? These, um, and these are all rational questions. And I want you to get into the habit of linking historical developments to rational debate and to historical interpretations.